Lord, we come before you tonight, God, just uh, in humble adoration to who you are. You are the Lord. You are God. And we know that, Lord God, we can come to you with anything, Lord. And you are there to hear us, to speak to us, to walk with us, God. Thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord God, for getting each one of us here safely. And I pray for each one of us to get back home safely tonight, God. Thank you. You are so good, Lord. We bless your name. Lord, I just pray that you receive this worship, this humble worship before you, God as we come before you, and uh, bless it, God. Thank you, Lord. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Why don't we stand? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty? So much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless and all in wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing. Grace, this is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, and I would be set free. Oh. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nation? With truth and justice Shines like the sun In all of its brilliance The King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would be Where? 
Okay. 
stand against what a wonderful name it is the name of jesus what a wonderful name it is the name of jesus what a wonderful name it is the name of jesus the name of jesus
Father, Lord, we come before you now just so thankful. Lord, this time of worship reminds me of when so many of your followers were leaving you because of the words that you spoke. You turned to disciples. You said, what about you? And they said, Lord, where would we go? So, Lord, where would we go? Lord, so we fall down before you. We cast our crowns, Lord, and we thank you for the opportunity you've given us. We thank you for our salvation. And Lord, we thank you that we can be here in this place this evening to worship you. Because God, only you and you alone are worthy of our praise. And Lord, we give thanks in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Good evening, Calvary Chapel, Richmond. Take two seconds to say hey. Good evening again. It's rainy Wednesday. Great day to be a Canadian goose. Uh, they were loving it, my neighborhood. Uh, and the birds are really happy no matter what. I, we have a screened-in porch, and I'll go out there, and uh, no matter what, they're just chirping away. doesn't matter if it's pouring. We need to be like birds, you know, Jesus. You know, look at them. They don't worry about anything, you know. But uh, good to see all of you tonight. That is good news about the VBS volunteers that I guess Taylor had forwarded me an invite to the creative password of the portal. I went in there today, and I thought I would see, like, because the other, we just, a couple of Wednesday nights ago, we were 16 volunteers. So I thought I was going to see, all right, what am I going to see here, 22, 24, and I saw, like, 40-something, and then now you said they're all filled, so that's a great, yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, you know, I went in there thinking that I would see just barely uh, over 20-something, but um People have come out of the woodwork, so thank you, any of you in this room that volunteered. Uh, we need your help. And, and I, already, I saw kids are already getting registered, too, so that's great. And we just got the signage up for the neighborhood. Uh, all good stuff. Um, uh, tomorrow, I'm glad it's raining like crazy today. It's only supposed to be cloudy tomorrow. We normally, when we do, the, we do these regional Calvary Chap Chapel pastor meetings and pray for each other and kind of encourage one another, we usually have 20 to 25 at the regional ones. We have 46 coming tomorrow. So nearly double, basically double, because the average would be like 23. It is exactly double of what we normally have. And so um, thank you for those that are helping. Uh, we have a little team that's helping uh, tomorrow from morning through the lunch. And then we have a time of prayer and other things like that. But um, uh, anyone that can help us with tables over here, we've got to transform this spot over here to seat. Uh, 46 to 50 people, and uh, without messing up the rest of the sanctuary, we don't want to mess the whole thing up. But um, that'll be after the service. Anyone that can stay and help, it won't take long at all. Uh, we could use your help with that. Uh, this Sunday, I'll be uh, moving out of Acts chapter 2. And so we see the birth of the church, and we move into Acts chapter 3 this Sunday. So even if you're out of town, you can still catch it. We've had people text and let us know, hey, I was out of town and still caught it, and it was great, so we're looking forward to getting into the third chapter this Sunday, but just kind of letting you know that's where we're at. And with that, uh, turn with me to Psalm 119, uh, an ambitious task to cover 176 verses tonight, which I'm not reading all of these verses, but um, nevertheless, we will uh, cover this uh, chapter Hopefully all of it. Uh, if I come up short, I'll let you know. Uh, but uh, hopefully we can do at least what I outlined here. I, I listened to a message at uh, East Coast Pastors Conference one year, and Damian Kyle covered the entire chapter in one sitting. So it can be done, and he inspired me that it can be done. Uh, now, he might have taken slightly longer than I plan on taking, but uh, but he did a great job. And anything Damian Kyle teaches, I, I love to listen to him teach the Word. But um He's out of Calvary Chapel Modesto, if you've never listened to it. Just type in Calvary Chapel Modesto, Damian Kyle, great, great teacher of God's Word. But um, uh, Psalm 119, and if you would turn there, uh, we will read just one verse. Um, 
uh, to kind of set the, because we can't read them all, but I want to read one verse that uh, pertains to the entire chapter. So look at verse 144, Psalm 119, verse 144, and we'll read that verse. The righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. Let's pray. Father, we know that your testimonies are uh, are everlasting. And Lord, we know that we need your understanding. And Lord, we desire to live, not just live and breathe, but live the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we just sang of you you being holy. And we, Lord, we want to be conformed to your image. We want to to receive, receive in our lives the fullness of Christ. We want the mind of Christ. We, Lord, we want to walk in your footsteps. And Lord, we know that one of your names is the Word, and we know that you are life. And Lord, we pray that your Word would be uh, life to us, but Lord, we know that it's because your Word comes from you. And so Lord, we just pray that you would open our eyes and Lord, prepare our hearts to apply all that we see, even things we've seen before, we'd see them afresh and anew tonight. And we ask this by the help of your Spirit. I ask for your help uh, to teach and share this as you would have me do it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So you see the title up on the screen for tonight's uh, study here in Psalm 119, the everlasting word, a lamp and a light. Uh, As I mentioned, and most of you probably already know this, uh, maybe all of you know it, but this psalm is the longest chapter in the Psalms, and in fact, it's the longest chapter in the entire Bible. Uh, This monumental Psalm uh, is the eternal and everlasting Word of God, but it's emphasized with great specificity. Uh, the life, it emphasizes the life-changing and life-giving power of adhering to the Word of God. Because a lot of people can hear it, but even Jesus said we don't want to be hearers only, we want to be doers. So it is adhering to the Word of God not just hearing, but adhering to it. Many significant works and commentaries, and maybe you pick some up. I know the ladies did a whole study uh, in this church on Psalm 119. I don't know how long back that was, but they did a study on Psalm 119. Many books have been written on Psalm 119. Commentaries have been written about this one chapter. Uh, Some well-known followers of Christ, if you want to take on a summer challenge, men like William Wilberforce, and David Livingston, they memorized the entire chapter. So that will get you through a car drive all the way to work if you would memorize Psalm 119. And I'm sure that there's a lot uh, of good that would come out of that if you could memorize it. Uh, now, some of you uh, maybe you're saying, uh, my brain isn't what it once was. I can't memorize a verse, much less 176 of them now. Uh, but these guys did, and God used them in a great way. Uh, Charles Spurgeon The Prince of Preachers there in London said of Psalm 119, this wonderful psalm from its great length helps us to wonder at the immensity of Scripture. Uh, From its keeping to one subject, it helps us adore the unity of Scripture. For it is but one. We know the entire Word of God is one word from the Lord. Yet from the many turns it gives to the same thought, it helps you see the variety of Scripture. And of course, our life has variety. So this passage has variety, and our life has variety in both good times and bad times, but you'll see both uh, in this psalm as well. Psalm uh, 119 is divided. uh, It's 176 verses, I mentioned, arranged in an acrostic pattern. It's divided into 22 even sections, eight verses each. So you probably have seen your Bible, like a little Hebrew symbol above each uh, each section there, which in that corresponds to the 22 letters of, of the Hebrew alphabet. The 22 sections uh, are assigned one distinct letter from the Hebrew alphabet, and then each line of each section begins with that letter. So all 22 sections have their own letter, their own, and each, uh, each section begins with that same Hebrew letter. Uh, this chapter is interesting. It's the Word itself illuminating the Word. Does that make sense? It's the Word illuminating the Word. And that's actually how we study Scripture as a whole. If you ever see a verse that doesn't make sense, you 
compare it to other passages in Scripture. The Scripture interprets the Scripture, and the Word illuminates the Word. In this chapter, ultimately, it illuminates the Word because it ultimately exalts the author of the Word. Uh, this is not a, you don't see uh, the psalmist talk a lot about prayer, but the entire passage itself is praying to God, talking to the Lord, uh, imploring of the Lord, asking of the Lord. So it's, uh, it's one very large prayer, if you will, throughout this entire uh, 176 verses. Uh, the scriptures, names for the scriptures, uh, the scriptures are mentioned in 171 out of 176 verses, and they use eight different Hebrew words for the scriptures. So it's not the exact same word, but eight different Hebrew words are used uh, two of them both mean word, uh, and you can see that you have law, uh, which is this Torah, word, debar, which is used 24 times. That means proceeding from God's mouth, judgments, testimonies, commandments, statutes, precepts, and then word again, but a different word, imra, and that means commanded, spoken, or promised. So they're two different Hebrew words, but they both mean the word word. You can see you have six others, so there's your total of eight. So you have 22 sections of eight. Eight different um, Hebrew words are used to describe the scriptures themselves. Uh, you know God doesn't do anything by accident, so all these things are exactly laid out exactly how he wants. It almost looks like a, a square building, and everything is uh, in perfectly intact, kind of like the ta tabernacle or the temple itself built. Uh, we don't know who the author was. Uh, there's no author uh, ascribed to this uh, book of the, uh, this chapter, but David is supposed by most scholars, uh, but there are uh, scholars that, that make a pretty good case for either Daniel or Ezra. So David, Daniel, Ezra are the three that are most often David by far, but some uh, do believe that Daniel or Ezra may have written it. Other than the acrostic arrangement, uh, there is no outline of this chapter. Um, sometimes you feel like your life doesn't have an outline, but uh, uh, there is no outline, and we'll get to that uh, as we go through it. There's no outline uh, other than the acrostic arrangement, and uh, obviously the very organized, each alphabet, as things like that. But um, there's many themes, but many themes are repeated. Uh, so you'll see a lot of repeating themes, and we'll cover uh, some of those themes that I wanted to highlight tonight. These passages were likely compiled over a significant portion of time, and very possibly, if not likely, over someone's entire lifetime. And so if, let's say it was David, he might have been writing this and adding to it all throughout his life until he gets to the end of his life, and that kind of closes it. So whoever wrote it, uh, if it was David, probably over uh, a long portion of time, if not a lifetime. And it would cover the author's life and the various difficult times and trials. Like if you're writing uh, your own prayers to God over the years, that you would have seasons that are quite difficult and seasons that uh, you see great victory and seasons that you see kind of the Lord's help and keeping you stay focused, things like that. Uh, but whoever the author is, uh, the word never failed them because the author never failed them. And the author of the word won't fail you or me either. Now, we'll fail the Lord a few times along the way, quite a few times, won't we? But he will not fail us. Now, because of these 22 sections, we'll look briefly at 22 observations. Can we do it in this time? 22 observations. We're not going to go, you know, a mile deep on all of them, but 22 observations or truths. They're all truths. They're not just observations. 22 truths or 22 learnings, 22 things that are true that we can learn from that many of you are already applying, if not all of these. Uh, most of these, but all of these are very important observations or truths or learnings from Psalm 119. The 22 truths that I've selected, um, they don't correspond directly to the 22 sections, but we essentially cover all 22 sections. In other words, some sections I would cover a few more than others, uh, but uh, we're, we'll cover at least a verse in every single section in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so I'll put 11 up at a time. Uh, because, um, well, that way we don't have, it, it's faster this way, so I can have them all up there, and I don't have to be clicking through things, and you can see there's the first 11 that we'll look at. Now, I put some verses beside them 
that's not an exhaustive list of the verses that would cover any of these things, nor do I, am I positive I'll even read all of those, uh, but uh, whatever I can, um, we will, and certainly uh, those are some, uh, some, some verses that I could correspond to those particular truths of the Word of God. The first, let's uh, turn in our Bibles back to the beginning of the chapter, uh, and I'll just read the first couple of verses, verses 1 through 3. If your Bibles are open, verse 1, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. His way. I love the simplicity of this. The opening, uh, the opening verses of this entire chapter. I love the simplicity. It's just to say, just walk in God's word. Don't try and lift a mountain. Don't try and keep every single thing you've ever heard of. Don't try and memorize it, even though William Wilberforce did. It doesn't say that. It just says to walk in his word. To walk in his word. And, and there's a blessing promised to those that will walk in his law, because we know the law is one of the words, one of the eight words in the Hebrew here that corresponds to his word, even though it says law there. And by the way, and we know that the, those that are lost are lawless, we don't, we don't hate that the word of God is law because he's written the law on the tablets of our hearts. So it's not uh, burdensome us to us now that we can't do this or we can't do that. No, we, we've been given the same taste and desires of the righteous Lord himself. And so we now desire his law. So uh, those who walk in it, and to walk, when you think about walk, I'll walk for a second here, if I can do it without walking into this mic. Uh, just walk for a second. When you walk, it's one step, another step, another step, it's another step, it's another step. Walking's different than standing. Standing, you're standing still. Walking implies that each step, you're going to have to keep turning the pages. Another day, another day, another day, another day. Walking in the Word is actually active. You have an active life in the Word of God. You're actively reading it, continuing it day by day, step by step. And it says with all your heart. And uh, the more you just, first it just says those who walk in it, when you start to walk in it, you will start to appreciate it with all your heart. Uh, you, it, you sometimes, well, never, matter of fact, anything I can think of that God's ever kind of matured in my life, or if you've been walking the Lord, you've probably seen this, you don't naturally mature in it. You do it first, and then God gives you a taste for it. When I was a kid, um, I don't know why, but we went to this place, and I was a small kid, and my whole family hated mint ch chocolate chip ice cream. But that's what they gave, and they gave it to me. And I, because I got it at a young age, I loved it instantaneously, and it, I, I acquired an immediate taste for it. But other people are going to have to work up. Uh, there's vegetables I've added in, in my later life. Uh, I've had to work a taste for them. You eat them first because you know they're good. Then you actually say, hey, after about a year of this, they actually taste good now. <laughs> My wife's got me on these things that, like, uh, that I, I'm starting to like. I, I told my daughter's head, I said, I don't need brown sugar on a sweet potato anymore. I now can embrace its natural flavor, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, but the Word of God works like that. So you just start getting into it, and you will start to love it uh, with your whole heart. Uh, let's look at the next one, verses 9 uh, through 12. Uh, drop down to verse 9. Uh, how can a young man or woman uh, cleanse his way by taking heed to your word? With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not uh, wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. I'm sure many of you have heard this passage before and read it. Uh, D.L. Moody used to say, and it's still worth Noting, I put it up on the screen. Uh, the Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. The Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. Uh, you can't hang out and digest and keep highlighting and reading and praying over the Word of God and just walk out and live any way you want to. 
because it will convict you. Now, if, if I, I, I have seen uh, Bible, I guess uh, there's the theologians at universities that teach the Bible and they're atheists and things of that nature. Uh, but that's different than someone who is eating the word of God as a meal every day. I mean, if it really is uh, part of sustaining you in life, uh, then you're not going to uh, feel real good about just kind of living some sinful lifestyle or just doing anything you want because the word is constantly convicting. And um, not only can we cleanse our way by taking heed because when we see something, you ever, uh, you ever been reading your devotional time and you see something that convicts you that you weren't convicted of until you read that verse? Like, it's not like you didn't know it. You just were oblivious. It was a blind spot, at least at that moment. It might even be, might even be something that was always a blind spot. Just that few days, it was a blind spot. Like you said, wow, that, I guess that I shouldn't have said that after all. Uh, I, thought, I thought that would be perfectly fine. And then later on, the, the word just convicts you. And uh, so the word obviously convicts us there. But also, to hide in our heart keeps us from sinning. I'd rather meditate on the word of God then think about so many of the things that are out there. Not only things that are uh, you know, bad or sinful, but just things that cause us to worry or doubt. The Bible says whatever things are good, and lovely, and of a good report. These are the things that, that we want to think on. So there's protection uh, with the Word of God. Uh, let's look at verse 16 and 17. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Uh, he mentioned servant uh, several times as well, by the way. We'll come. We'll make note of that a little later. But um, the delight, if uh, I will delight myself in your statutes, uh, if we choose to delight in God's word, and we choose not to forget it, we can be assured that it will be a delight. And if it becomes a delight, we're not going to forget it. Because God will always honor his word. He'll be faithful to his word. If he says, this is what I will impart to you, that you will actually delight in it. And I mentioned this uh, last Wednesday. You know, you know, don't try and read the entire Bible in one sitting. You're much better off reading a handful of verses. And when I mean a handful, it's different for every person. You know, some of you a handful might be 20 verses. Some of you a handful might be six or seven. Uh, I would, you know, even you could read five or six and really chew on them and meditate on them throughout the day. Uh, that would be more beneficial than reading like a bunch of chapters and you can't remember a single word. That's the way we did high school, right? You know, we would cram the book in the middle of the night and we read the whole thing. We can't remember one word, but we read an entire book from midnight to 4 a.m. and now we can't remember any of it. So you'd be better off reading something you can delight in. That makes sense? Like, uh, and all you can eat buffet in 10 minutes is not enjoyable. Uh, you might as well eat something you can enjoy. So uh, if we want to delight in it. Say, Lord, I want to take this, this amount right here. I want to read it and actually digest it. And I try and think of at least one word out of that. Um, I can't remember which one. I think it was Matthew Henry's father uh, told him to read one verse every day and meditate on that one verse every day. And then if you did that, Throughout the year, you would uh, you'd go through it twice because it's 176 verses. So uh, that's pretty cool as well. Ver uh, next one, verse 21. You rebuke the proud, the cursed, who stray from your commandments. Now, this doesn't sound like a, a fun verse for the believer, and it's not for it. But it says uh, you. He still the psalmist is still n noting what he has seen in his lifetime. That God eventually does rebuke the proud. It might seem like people are getting away with their sin. It might seem like people are getting away with just shaking their fist in God. And it might seem like people are getting away with doing whatever they want. The cursed who stray from your commandments. But there's a warning here. And the proud are called the cursed. Uh, you, do not wanna, you don't want God to call you the cursed. Uh, you want him to call you the blessed, the redeemed. But the proud, those who are still living in pride, are the curse. Because why? Because they've strayed from, and more importantly, they've rejected the commandments of God. You know, we will not have the Ten Commandments rule over us. We'll make up our own laws. We'll make up our own 
which is our society today. We'll make up any law that, that kind of makes us feel good about what we want to do. Uh, the, the cursed or the proud, they refuse the commands of God. The proud are mentioned six times, uh, and they're synonymous with the wicked, which are also mentioned six times. So six times in Psalm 119, the, pr- the, uh, the proud are mentioned, and six times the wicked are mentioned, a total of 12 times. Uh, this psalm expresses uh, that, the, that the proud and the wicked, uh, uh, throughout the entirety of it, I'm just kind of giving you a panorama of things that the psalmist writes about the proud or about the wicked, but he expresses the proud and wicked that they lie, other, other parts of this, uh, of this chapter. They lie, they oppress, they lay snares, they persecute, they bind, and they wait to destroy the righteous. And what the psalmist is observing about them is what God observes about them. And so the, obviously the Holy Spirit uh, gave that to the psalmist. They want to destroy the righteous. Uh, but it's a warning, and all the way in verse 155, which is near, uh, getting near the end of the chapter, it says that salvation is far from the wicked. Um, you're either completely saved or you're not saved. You're not almost saved or partially saved. Salvation is far from the wicked. You're either completely lost or completely saved. Amen? Amen. If you're completely saved, you've been completely changed. That's why Jesus says you've been born again. But salvation is far from the wicked. Here in this month of June that our nation uh, and other nations around the world uh, call Pride Month, which was a really bad choice, but it lines up perfectly with Satan, uh, and and his fall was pride. Uh, We have a society uh, that is celebrating rebellion rebellion. We're celebrating rebellion. We're celebrating rebellion towards God. And thankfully, uh, God forgives all of us of our rebellion. He forgave me in 1996 of mine, and many of you that say he's forgiven you of your rebellion. There's no rebellion he wouldn't forgive us from. Uh, But that's if we turn. If we reject his commands, if we reject his command, by the way, one of the commands is be saved. One of the commands is repent. It's not just the commands in here, although these commands all dovetail into repent. But uh, it's a strong warning. Look at verse uh, 25. How bad am I doing? How good am I doing? My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. So we have number five here is the reviving of the word. If you just follow it on the screen, you can see this is number five. Um, Nine times in Psalm 119 are the words, revive me. And every time they show up, I'm going to read the verse to you, so you'll see all nine times this evening. And remember, uh, this was written likely over many years, if not a lifetime. And I would say that any of you who have been saved any length of time, you for a few times have probably had to say, Lord, would you revive me? If this was over a lifetime, revive me again. Revive me. That's why we, when we pray for revival, it's not usually a one-time thing. Revivals do cool off, unfortunately. And, this, and they won't cool off in heaven, but in this, in, this time, in this time and space, they do. And so he's saying, revive me according to your word. Uh, the word itself gives us the desire to be revived. Uh, but written over a, a lifetime, if you look at um, verse 28 and 29, my soul melts from heaviness, strengthen me according to your word. Uh, when our soul melts, we need the reviving work of God. Uh, I love tw- verse 29, remove from me the way of lying. Do you ever ask God, Lord, help me overcome this, whatever it may be. Revive me in such a way that uh, I, I, I see victory uh, in this area of my life. He goes on in verse 31 and 32, I cling to your testimonies, do not put me to shame. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. I love that um, in verse 32 there, I'll run the course of your commandments. And I think of uh, where to run, uh, Paul said he had finished his course, we're to run our course according to his commandments. Uh, we want his commandments, uh, even in Hebrews 12, it says let us run the race set before us. If we're going to run our race, if we're going to finish our course, we have to run it according to the commandments of the Lord and keep our eyes on his commandments because that keeps us on the path, that keeps us on uh, the course that he has given us. Now, we don't know the exact path of our life, but we do know the path of the word of God. So we stay on the path of the word of God, which keeps us on the path of our life 
which is only known to God. He doesn't, he knows next week we don't. But we can stay in his, we can walk in his word, and he'll walk us into next week uh, in the course of our life while we stay within the course of our commands. And he says, uh, I, for you shall enlarge my heart. And I think about that as both spiritually and physically, uh, that he not only will enlarge our heart spiritually, that we have more of a heart for the lost or more of the heart uh, for righteousness or more of a heart for people to be discipled, but also that he enlarges our heart in the sense that uh, the Lord will keep us going to the end of whatever our course is. And there's many people that have defied death numerous times. They look back and say, that was the Lord. You know, So all of these things uh, certainly speak to him. Um, I don't have time, even time to get to 37 and 40, but, uh, oh, I did promise that every time the word revive. So I do, I uh, will. Uh, 37, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. This is uh, uh, the word revive number two. And then the third place it's used here is in verse 40. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. Don't be afraid to pray, God, revive me. If the psalmist prayed it nine times in here, you can pray it too. You can be on safe ground to keep praying. Lord, revive me, revive me. And, and use the actual words. Revive me according to your word, according in the way, in your righteousness. All of these things we can certainly relate to. Number six, uh, look at verse 41. Let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. Now, we looked at the mercy of God last week in Psalm 118, and certainly uh, we see his mercy mentioned here. Uh, mercy or merciful is mentioned five times in Psalm 119. You would not get through life but by the mercy of God. So uh, we all need the mercy of God. We know his mercies are new every day. Let your mercies come to me. Uh, we want his mercy so we just can fulfill his will in our life. We need his mercies uh, to put one foot in front of the other and many other things that he calls us to do. In verse 45, it says, And I'll walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. There's nothing like walking in freedom. I'll walk at liberty. It's the mercy of God that gives us a spirit of freedom. We're not under the bondage of this world. We're not under the bondage of our own flesh. We're not under the bondage of, you know, um, just the lust of this world and the pride of life, which Peter wrote of um, the longer you're saved the more you realize that all the stuff that everybody else is chasing doesn't really satisfy anyway so it's just bondage you know it's just it's just more stuff uh, to manage verse 47 uh, and I will delight myself in your commandments which I love uh, we want to get to the place that uh, we do love his commands and uh, the more we receive his mercy the more we love his commands Let's, uh, I don't have time to go through all of them. Look at verse 64, drop down a little bit, way, a little ways to verse 64. And this is number seven, the instruction of the word. Verses 64 through 68, it says, The earth, O Lord, is full of your mercy. Well, definitely for the, for the believer. Teach me your statutes. Uh, it's one thing, it's interesting that, you know, the disciples said this. Remember, we talked about where the disciples said, to Jesus, teach us how to pray. Now, they had seen Jesus pray, and they had read about prayer many times in the Old Testament. Would you not agree that they had read about prayer all throughout? They grew up uh, in synagogue. They grew up going to the temple. They had, But they asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. And it's one thing for you and I to know something, but we actually tell Jesus, I know this intellectually, but teach it to me. Uh, I love the new cliche, teach to me like I'm a fifth grader. You know, that is something that, that we can ask the Lord to do. Teach me your statutes. He goes on, uh, for you have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me, verse 66 there, teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. Now, if we do believe his commandments, we've got a good chance of being taught the commandments. But if we don't believe the commandments, of course, there's no opportunity to be taught. But because we do believe your commandments, uh, his commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Uh, and Lord will afflict us uh, when we astray away, because whom the Lord loves, he chastens. You are good and do good. Verse 68, teach me your statutes. So the word uh, instructs us, and uh, we have not only the word uh, with the ascension of Jesus and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So we have the word and the Spirit, and the Spirit illuminates the Word to teach us these things. Uh, ten times, ten times 
uh, in Psalm 119, the psalmist requests the Lord to teach him 10 times. And this says, teach me. Uh, eight of those say specifically teach me, and then others are uh, different wording of the same thing. Uh, but 10 times uh, teach me. So this is another thing we can learn because so much of this is a prayer. We can learn to pray, Lord, teach me this verse. So let's say you read a verse tomorrow and it strikes you, it comes off the page. You say, Lord, I don't even know an inch deep about what I'm reading here, but would you teach me what this looks like in my life? Or would you teach me to be maturing uh, in this? And I believe those are the kind of, the Lord is wanting us to read his word back to him. That's why we sometimes in our prayer meetings will read, read the word. Uh, let's look at the next one, number eight. The comfort of the word dropped down to verse 81. Uh, 81. Like I said, it's not an outline. There's repeating things, but I'm just showing you different truths that, that are all in here that we can look at and, and clearly see them not only here, but in other part passages of Scripture that would mirror them. Uh, verse 81, my soul faints for your salvation, but I hope in your word. Uh, it doesn't mean that the psalmist doesn't think he's saved. It's we look forward to that eternal salvation. Amen? That when we no longer need to be comforted because we're actually in heaven. We no longer need to overcome difficult times because they've all been overcome. We know they've already been overcome by the blood of the Lamb, but our soul looks forward to that eternal peace with the Lord. But he goes on in verse 82, My eyes fail from searching your words, saying, When will you comfort me? And then in verse 83, for I have become like a wineskin and smoke, yet I do not forget your statue. Uh, you ever felt like you didn't have one single drop left in the tank? Or you were so sad, or so worried, or so just devastated by things in life, and we all have had these things. But the scriptures, it's, uh, the scriptures are not just words. They are supernatural. Anything else you read is informative. Some of them are informative. Some of them are junk. But uh, there's lots of things that are informative, but they're not super, supernatural. I like, uh, I don't know where Ray is. He gives me a subscription every year to Consumer Reports. I enjoy reading it. I just like to read it. There's really nothing supernatural about it. I just like information and data points. So I enjoy, like, even stuff I'm never going to buy. I like looking at it and say, Hmm, that one's better. I'll never even own that. But uh, it's just nice to know this useless information now. Uh, and every now and then there's things that I really do find, you know, grass seeds or whatever else it may be. But the Word of God is powerful. So uh, the Word can comfort and calm us like no person on earth can do. You can need just a big wrap around, and you can open up the Word of God and God will do that. For you. No one else can do it in the same way. Uh, drop down to verse 88. Uh, this is the next time we see the word revive. I said every time it comes up, we'll look at it. Verse 88, revive me according to your loving kindness so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. Uh, I love the psalmist. Reminds the Lord of his loving kindness. Lord, you are loving and kind. Moses used to remind the Lord he was gracious and all these different things. Uh, but uh, we, again, these different seasons, we're back to praying for revive me, revive me again. Uh, number nine, the eternal nature of the word. Look at verse 89 and 90. It's just one down from that word uh, that we just looked at in verse 88. Verse 89, uh, a very well-known verse, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. If you've ever wondered where that verse is, now you know. Uh, if you've heard people quote this one, it's right here in Psalm 1, 1989, forever, O oh Lord, and this also matches with our, our title of the night, uh, the everlasting word. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Verse 90, your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth and it abides. Um, God is eternal and his word is eternal. Uh, this world's going to fade away, but the word of God is never going to fade. Uh, and it's just as trustworthy today as it was 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. It's forever settled. I look at uh, the next one, verse 92 through 95, is the rescue of the word. Um, starting verse 92, unless your law had been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. There's many times that uh, the word has kept us steady. I will not for, I'll never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours. 
save me. I am yours, save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked wait for me to destroy me. There's one of those passages of uh, the, the, the nature of the wicked. Uh, but I will consider your testimonies. Uh, the word of God rescues us uh, by turning us to him to rescue us. So the word of God turns us to the source. It reminds us that we can, we can stand in there. We can be steadfast and immovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord because he will encourage us with the word and then keep us. Uh, when we look at the promises that were given to all the other saints, God did not love them more than us. He loves us the same as he loved them. And the things that he did for David, or they did for Paul, or they did for Moses, he would do for you and me. And so we can say, all right, Lord, you rescued them, you can rescue me. Uh, let's look at the next one, <clears throat> the meditation of the word, number 11. <clears throat> and we're halfway there. Uh, not, verse 97, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And in verse 99, I have more understanding than all my teachers. Your testimonies are my meditation. Uh, you can be taught by people that don't know the Lord, but if you know the Lord, you, you end up with more wisdom than they have. And many of you are put in workplaces and, and uh, you have wisdom that God has given you that uh, you know, Daniel found this out. He was not the king, but he had wisdom that the king did not have. And so the Lord will give you uh, his wisdom, especially when you meditate on his word. And he goes on uh, to say in verse 103, uh, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Uh, the meditation of God's word becomes the medication of God's word. So let me say that again. The meditation of God's word becomes the medication. Uh, the word of God can do healing for us that literally medicines can't do uh, because it changes our spirit. It, cha it gives us joy, and joy has in and of itself uh, a great healing impact on the body and the mind that becomes sweeter the more we move from just reading it to actually digesting it to meditating on it. Uh, so I, I would just, you know, we have this summer, even though I, you know, jokingly said memorize the whole thing like Wilberforce or uh, David Livingston, but what we can do is say, Lord, I want to get back into the practice of meditating on a verse and see what God will do as we meditate. Uh, you know, I chew gum here and there. Gum loses its flavor, but the Word of God grows in flavor. Uh, gum goes like downhill in about two minutes, and all the fun is gone after a little while there. And the Word of God, the flavor gets better with time. So it's quite opposite. And meals that you ate last night, you can remember how, but you can't get it back in your mouth. But the Word of God, you can chew on it and chew on it and chew on it. All right, the next 12, next 11, if I pull it off, we shall see. Uh, verse 105 is number 12 here. Uh, verse 105, find it. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Everyone has probably heard that one. Even, even some people that have never walked dark in the doors of a church have probably heard it somewhere. Your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. This is where that passage is found right here. Uh, and you probably will notice that various verses you've heard in your lifetime. Wow, there's another one in Psalm 119. I didn't remember it was in Psalm 119, or I didn't even know. Uh, but there it is. And um, we know that in a world of darkness and confusion, we have the light of God's Word. We have something that shines light on darkness, but also shines light on confusion, on difficult situations. And I love that it's a lamp to our feet. You know, our feet, uh, it's not a lamp. 150 yards out. It is just a day-by-day -day thing. It's just a little bit wait. We're walking. We get just enough light to take the next step, to take the next step, to take the next step, which also, um, you know, tells us that we have to remain in it. So we eat with each step. Uh, we are getting the light of his word. So we have a, even though God has saved us by grace, we now have a stewardship. We have a diligence that required to be disciples. We have to be disciplined and discipline is not a bad thing. Discipline is a good thing. We have to become disciplined and opening his word and it being that lamp into our feet because the world is dark and our own thoughts sometimes 
uh, aren't near as bright as we think they are. Uh, we come to find out, hey, that wasn't even a bright idea. That was a really <laughs> bad idea. I need the word to illuminate uh, my thinking and my direction. Uh, let's look at verse 110 for uh, number 13 here, the anchor of the word, verse 110. The wicked have laid a snare for me. That's not good news. Yet I have not strayed from your precept. Um, whether you know it or not, Satan lays snares for you and me. He's seeking whom he may devour. He, uh, I, I guess the only way you don't have to worry about Satan is if you already are doing his stuff. So, and then he will not bother you. But if you are trying to live for the Lord, you will have a target on your back to some degree. Everybody that chooses to serve the Lord, the, you know, uh, the righteous will suffer persecution and, um, that this world is not our home. And Jesus said, you will have trials and you will have tribulations, but the wicked have set a snare. But we have the anchor. He says, even though they've set a snare for me, uh, I've not given in and, and joined them. I've not strayed from your commandments. Paul said that all the things that came against him, none of these things, he said, none of these things moved me. They didn't move him. He became immovable in the help of the Lord. So the word is an anchor. It gives us courage. It gives us confidence. It gives us a stick to and a steadiness. Uh, number 14 is, drop down to verse 114, four, four, the number 14, verse 114, uh, you are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Isn't it great to know that the word of God is our hiding place and a shield? And then in verse 116 and 17, uphold me according to your word that I may live I do, do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Hold me up, verse 117, I shall be safe. I shall observe your statutes continuously. Um, again, I've talked about this many times. When you see the word hope, spiritually speaking, in the Bible, it does not mean like, I hope I win the lottery, uh, and I hope uh, my team wins the Super Bowl, even though you know your team has no chance and has never won the Super Bowl. I hope they do it this year. That's not the kind of hope. Hope is an expectation. We have the hope of the resurrection. It is a, it's a guarantee. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. So we have a joyful expectation that, Lord, I hope and you're sustaining me or holding me up. You can be believed that God will hold you up. As long as now he's holding on to us, even those times where we let go, thankfully, that's grace. Because there are times when we don't even hold up our end of the bargain, which is a lot of times, right? <laughs> Uh, but the, he keeps sending us back to, oh, yeah, our hope is in you. And so it's a joyful expectation that we have. Uh, the next one, the hope of the word in verse 114. Verse 114, um, I already had that one. Uh, the anchor of the word, the hope of the word. I already covered that. So move on to 15. On to 15, the urgency of the word. Uh, look at verse 125. Um, I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. Uh, verse 126, it is time for you to act, O oh Lord. You ever had a prayer like this? It is time for you to act, Lord. <laughs> for they have regarded your law as void. This, you're watching the news and you see this verse come off, off, off page. You're like, Lord, it's time for you to act. They have no regard for your law. I know some of you pray the prayer like that. You, you, you like some of David's smash them into powder verses, you know, that, you know, uh, grind them, you know, uh, these, some of these verses that David prayed. We don't know if this is David, but he does pray some of those. Um, beat them like the wind and all these other things. Uh, it's time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void. Uh, but I, my takeaway really kind of go back up to even verse 24, where it says, deal with your servant according to your mercy. <laughs> So if you if take it in context, remember the 2020 rule, go above and below. Uh, Psalm 119, it's not usually the 2020 rule. It's like three or four rule in either direction because you have these compact sections. Uh, but verse 124, deal with your servant according to your mercy. And then it goes into, I am your servant. Then it says, it is time for you to act, Lord. Your servant is taking a beating. The world is crowding against me. Uh, I can't take it anymore. It's time for you to act. You're the only one that can move the needle here. Uh, but um, first of all, we're to, those that abide in his word, we are his servants. That's all we are. 
were servants. We, we, Jesus taught disciples they were going to wash feet. And so even as you wash feet, uh, you know, you would think that the world's going to love that you are doing nice things like that, but they don't. Uh, they hated Jesus. Why would you? They killed him. He only raised people from the dead and healed people, so they're not going to love uh, us any better. But as servants, we have urgent needs, and the Word addresses our urgent needs. And our faith in God is that He alone can meet those needs. So we're asking on Him to act not only for us, but, you know, where he and he alone can, you know, there are things that, you know, when we see things that just uh, are travesties, like, you know, we see, you know, things happening to children or we see things happening to innocent people. We need God to act in those things because we can't do anything anyway. So we need him to, we need him to move in a mighty way. And, and we see people trafficked or all this stuff. We're like, Lord, we, we need you to do what only you can do. So you can understand the urgency, but the word informs us that, uh, Next one, number 16, the wonder of the word, verse 129 and 130. Uh, your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The entrance of your word gives life. Uh, the more we study and believe God's word, the more wonderful his word seems to us. His, his words of wonder and power, they actually touch our soul. They actually touch all the way uh, to the soul level. Uh, which only his word can do, um, verses 129 and 30 were the verses we looked at. And he talks about here, therefore my soul keeps them. Uh, God empowers our soul to, uh, to stay on course, but also just gives us uh, what we need uh, to, to stay in awe and to stay in wonder of the word of God and ultimately the author of the word of God. Uh, the next one, uh, number 17, the faithfulness of the word. Uh, this is verses 138. Make your face shine upon your servant. Nope, not that one. That's a good one too, but uh, that was my eyesight there. 138, your testimonies which you have commanded are righteous and very faithful. My zeal has consumed me because my enemies have forgotten your word. Your word is very pure, verse 40, therefore your servant loves it. And he goes on in verse 142, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth, which actually is number 18 there. But let me just stop for a second on these other ones. Um, the word is faithful, as I mentioned, because the author is faithful. And here's some verses uh, that you probably have read, but they're all, they all say the same thing. He will never leave us nor forsake us. It's, it's written in the Old Testament. It's written in the New Testament. He's never going to leave us, never going to forsake us. Uh, if you look at verse 149, you'll see revive again. Revive me according to your justice, as in verse 149. If you look at verse 154, you'll see revive and the word redeem. You ever, you ever, you know you're saved and say, Lord, uh, your redemptive power in my life. Redeem things that I can't redeem. Uh, redeem and revive. We're already saved, but we understand uh, the prayer there. No, verse 156, greater your tender mercies, revive me. There's the uh, 156 uh, would make number eight. And then 159, uh, consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. That's the ninth time the word revive is mentioned there. And so he's not only faithful to, um, he's not only faithful uh, to us, through the word, but we can know that he'll be faithful to revive us again and again and again. He'll get you through another season, and another desert season, another difficult season, and a lot of busyness and all this stuff and distractions, and he'll revive again and again and again. And so then back to verse 160, uh, verse 160. Uh, I didn't read verse 160 yet, uh, but the entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endure forever. The entirety, uh, put the list back up, that's number 17, no, number 18. Uh, number 18, the entirety of your word is truth and a world of lies. And by the way, our own flesh and our own feelings can easily deceive us. True? Our, uh, uh, I love when the barracks were here. I remember Lynn was talk, uh, or Linda was talking, get Jen up here, she's like, uh, I... I she said this in the ladies' thing. She said, our feelings are real, but not always true. And I don't know if that struck some of you ladies that came, but our feelings are real, but not always true. And I was like, that's a really well 
stated uh, fact that you know our, our feelings can be real, but that does not make them true. And we need the Word of God to not only uh, show us the deception outside these four walls, but even the deception of our own flesh, because we've got a fallen flesh that actually can deceive ourselves into well, you know, that this makes a lot of sense, and rationalize this and that and the other, and uh, so we need the Word of God. Uh, but the entirety of your word is true. You, you, you start reading the Bible, any part you read is true. All of it's true. Uh, and it, um, we're holding, you know, my hands are on my Bible. It's the only perfect truth you will hold in this lifetime. Everything else will not ever be entirely true. There'll be something in there. Uh, but we can stand on the word of God. The next one, verse 161, verse ni- number, it's number 19 on the list. The rejoicing of the word, verse 161. Uh, Princes, notice that, you can even look at that. Princes persecute me without a cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. Verse 162, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. And then verse 164, drop down. Seven times a day. I praise you. That verse has had a profound impact on me. That verse, a lot of these verses. That, but that seven times a day, I praise you, has stuck with me, kind of like Daniel would go and pray three times a day. And I was like, I, I need seven is completion. It's the number of perfection in the Bible. It's, it's showing that if you want to have kind of a, a perfect kind of understanding of God, praise him all day long. Complete the whole day in praise. You know, So um, there's times where I'm like, I have been complaining about from one o'clock to four o'clock. I haven't had a praise come anywhere near my mind, uh, but I've had a lot of complaints come in. And then you know, this, this passage uh, reminds me, but um, this one here, uh, it's interesting, uh, the rejoicing of the word, number 19 here. Uh, he says, princes persecute me. It's interesting, the elites of this world, the princes of the world, the elite of this world, they despise the word of God. And they despise anyone that follows the word of God. And you'll see that in our country for sure. Anyone that, of the elitist, uh, the elitist level, if this world is their home, they despise the word of God. And the more elite they are, the more they persecute because they actually have power. They own institutions. They have people that can do their dirty work. And uh, so the psalmist realized that. But nevertheless, uh, learned in all seasons and everything to rejoice and praise God at all times. Number 20, the peace of the word. Look at verse 165. Uh, 165, great peace. Another amazing treasure you can hold on to this verse. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. I have quoted this verse to myself a gazillion times. I know that's not a word, but it feels like one. Uh Great peace of those who love your law. What a treasure this verse is. If, you're, if, if we're lacking peace, we need his law. We need his boundaries. We need his truth. Uh, and if we go all the way back to verse 1, remember it says, blessed are those that walk in the law of the Lord. Here it uses law too, same Hebrew word. Uh, to walk in his law causes us to love his law, which brings our soul peace, because now we're not fighting against we're just resting in the arms of the one who says, this is, this is perfect. You can lean back on this. And that peace flows into our hearts from heaven right into our hearts. Number 21. We're barely over. I apologize. I did, still did it slightly shorter than Damien Kyle, so I'm just saying. But anyway, you might have done it better, I'm sure. But over 172. My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. The reading of God's word compels us to speak it. Speak it aloud. Um, Speak it to others. Encourage people. Speak forth the gospel. The reading of the word compels us to speak uh, forth the word. Uh, When when the barracks were here, hope out loud. You know, Ben talked about speaking the word actually has uh, just a power in our life, and it certainly does. And the psalmist certainly understood that. And then the last one, uh, number 22, the shepherding of the word. And we'll just read it from 173 to the bottom. Let the 
Let your hand become my help, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation. Uh, that, that time will be with our shepherd for all eternity. O oh Lord, your law is my delight. Let my soul live. Let, let it live it out while we're here. And it shall praise you while we're here. Let's live it in the praise, Lord, and let your judgments help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Here's a, just a good admission at the end of this prayer. Lord, let's be, let's be real here. I have gone astray at times. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. The only reason we don't forget them is because of mercy. It's grace that we don't forget them. But here is acknowledgement. And all of this, I still sometimes stray. You know, in the mind or, you know, all of these things. Uh, we're sheep for our entire lifetime. Because we're sheep for our lifetime, entire lifetime, we need the shepherd for the entire lifetime. And the word is the voice of the shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. The word of God is his voice in our ears and in our souls that renews us, that reminds us, that redirects us again and again and again. And if you have a Bible, mark it up like this. You know, uh, Let it become your journal, your every, just mark it up really good. Refer back to it, walk in his word, hear his voice as our shepherd day by day, hour by hour. We know it's everlasting, and it really is a lamp and a light to our feet. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the surety of your word. Uh, Lord, we know that uh, every verse we read, even if I didn't even teach on them, just reading them has power because they are given to us from heaven through your servants and by the work of the Holy Spirit, we know it's all God breathes. So, Lord, just we pray that uh, just hearing these verses, even if we've heard them other times, Lord, that uh, we leave here encouraged that we're standing on the promises of God. And we ask, Lord, for your help to lead us, that we hear your word, we walk in it, and, Lord, we live by the power of your Holy Spirit with your praise on our lips and, Lord, your courage and confidence and peace in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Uh, we